a hillside in Azerbaijan, gas seeps from the oil deposits beneath the earth and spontaneously ignites. Close by, a sacred flame, symbol of divine power, has burned in a Zoroastrian temple for a thousand years. In the 20th century, the mysterious black fluid on which it feeds has been the maker of a very different world. In 1991, after his defeat in the Gulf War, the Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein set fire to the oil fields of Kuwait. Oil has brought many benefits to modern society in this century, and oil has been at the center of economic conflict, political struggle, and war. Now it faces a whole new challenge, the rise of the environmental conscience. I think history might show that just as Chernobyl illustrated the horrors and dangers of nuclear power, the Gulf War underlined the real costs of the oil economy in terms of its impacts on the environment, human suffering, and ultimately war. The war is over, the fires are out, but every day in the United States, a similar quantity of oil, the day, is burned and goes out the exhaust pipes of their cars. Los Angeles is the city that oil made, and oil is the biggest business on earth. Los Angeles, golden city of the American sunset. It's built on a pool of oil, but here we don't burn that oil ceremonially. We just burn that oil for power to push our cars. A hydrocarbon society, the American dream. The center of it, a moving automobile. I'm Roger Kennedy, the director of the National Museum of American History, and like all Americans, an automobile addict. American motorists drive two trillion miles a year. Good afternoon, I'm Earl Smith, and I'm out doing what I love to do, driving my car. And somewhere in the world, a new car rolls off the assembly line every second. My name is Laura Crossan. I am an actress and a writer, and I work in a hospital. We're driving on the Hollywood freeway right now. Every day, enough new cars hit the road to form a traffic jam 375 miles long. And every single day of the year, humankind produces one and a third billion dollars worth of crude oil. From his office on the 42nd floor, the chairman of ARCO, America's eighth largest oil company, manages an $18 billion a year business. But ARCO is only a cog in this, the industry, that drives the modern world. Well, the 20th century has been called the age of oil. It has caused countries to go to war with each other in order to control oil sources. It's uh, provided enormous uh, revenues to different countries, and politically that's terribly important. It affects our daily lives, the quality of our lives. It just permeates the entire societies around the world. Oil is the lifeblood of the global economy. It provides us with plastics, chemicals and fertilizers. But more than anything else, it provides us with mobility. Motor vehicles consume half of the oil used in the United States. And the reason for that rate of consumption 
is a love affair peculiar to our time. You know, a lot of people from other places just don't understand it, but in California, you are your car. You've got to have one. It's a basic necessity. It's kind of like toothbrush, floss, your car. you got to have it. I love the feeling of independence and freedom that this car brings me. This car is as much a part of my private life as my living room is. However, I'm also paying a very high price. I'm contributing to smog, I'm contributing to the gridlock in the city, and I know that. But I cannot do all the things that I usually do in the course of one day if I had to depend on public transportation here. I'm using an awful lot of petroleum. Every time I use some more, it means that the earth I inhabit is impoverished to that extent. And the air is dirtier and the ground is dirtier. And there's less of this planet Earth that's worth inhabiting. When after 1940, the American century started, it was projecting the image of the good times as containing the car as an absolutely essential element of it. Freedom of movement, the privacy of a car, the luxury of a car. Hollywood has sold around the world the image of the car, the freeway, and the personal freedom that it creates. But it is also here that concern for the environment is the greatest and is the most dynamic and volatile issue on the new political agenda. Smog in the Los Angeles area is the worst in America. Californians were the first to realize that they were poisoning the air they breathe, and they passed laws to stop it. California today is really at the forefront of global environmental regulation. And when we look back on the 1990s, we may end up saying that the regulators and legislators in California were at least as influential, if not more influential, than OPEC ministers in determining the future state and the future shape of the world oil industry. Tough new regulations say that in another 10 years, 10% 10 of all new vehicles sold here must emit no pollution at all. So large is the California car market that manufacturers everywhere must fall into line. It's ironic that here in the Magic City, a new model of energy consumption and concern for the environment is being created and that could well spell the demise of the oil age. One of the consequences of uh, the new environmental uh, era is not only substantive compliance, but what might be called figurative compliance. For instance, off uh, the coast of California, you find facilities that to the naked eye look not like oil platforms, but look like lush tropical condominium communities, complete with waterfalls and palm trees. When companies drill near the coastline here, they feel compelled to conceal their presence. Arcos facility off the Los Angeles coast has been transformed into Fantasy Island. It's the industrial version of cosmetic dentistry. There is a price to be paid for this. It is now virtually impossible to drill for oil in some of the most promising areas of the United States. There may be as much as 13 billion barrels of oil off the U.S. coastline that the American oil industry is not allowed to touch. California may care about its environment, but it does burn more gasoline in a day than Germany or Japan. Now, ever since I was a young guy, I remember wanting a nice car, a sports car, a red car. And now that I have it, I can honestly say I don't think I could live without it. I enjoy it. It's a rush that I get from just seeing a beautiful car, something sleek, something fast. An oil man and rancher, Robert O. Anderson is a legend of the oil business. 
While Semi retired, he formed a $100 million oil company just to keep his hand in. Now the man who opened up the rich oil fields of Alaska senses a new mood in his industry. The industry definitely is under something of a siege mentality. Uh, the Exxon Valdez incident really brought it to a crisis or brought it to a head is the real thing that haunts the industry. It could happen to anyone. The 1989 oil spill disaster caused by the tanker Exxon Valdez was a watershed in the history of the oil industry. Exxon spent billions of dollars cleaning up the damage and settling lawsuits. The harm done to Alaska's marine and wildlife caught the public imagination and galvanized the environmental movement. As a result, America's coastlines became obstacle courses for the oil industry. In order to move oil from Alaska down to the west coast of California involves complying with environmental regulations. The amount of environmental regulations has grown and grown over the last few years. In order to move oil from the Gulf Coast of the United States up to the East Coast, a shipper must comply with upwards of 10,000 separate environmental regulations. We are the bad people, the oil companies, you know. We, we make a product that pollutes the atmosphere and everything else. But on the other hand, we produce it and make it because there is a public demand for it. Demand for oil is here, and we're the ones who are causing that fight for decent air and a decent world to be lost because we keep wanting to use more oil. Anything happening in Russia? Well, you might tell me a little bit about uh, what's happening in China today. Is Walter back yet? A popular notion that the oil industry in the United States has enormous political power, I think, is overstated. I kind of feel like the oil industry in the U.S. is undergoing what happened to the stature in my office. Uh, as you can see, it's been carved up pretty badly over the years and that's beginning to happen to us. The real price of gasoline in the United States is about as cheap as it's been since World War II, and the American industry has lost half a million jobs in the last 10 years. Robert O. Anderson believes that though the American oil industry has fueled the nation's economic and military might for more than a century, its glory days as an oil producer are over. The Japanese have a term for it, a sunset industry. It means that it's going to go down over the horizon. The domestic oil industry is clearly in a sunset phase. Every year, our production goes down, uh, the lowest in 50 years. The world industry isn't going to be more than 10, 15 years behind it. The United States was once the world's largest oil exporter. Now it imports 45% of its oil, a figure that seems certain to rise. A decade ago, perhaps a senior oil man would have felt uh, controversial but important. Today, there's this feeling not only of defensiveness, but maybe almost of irrelevance that at least in a country like the United States, which was the home of the oil industry, uh, that the country doesn't want to have an oil industry. And therefore, as a result, you see a migration that's occurring away from the United States out to other parts of the world that do want to have an oil industry. Oil contributes at least 95% of the total hard currency earnings of the Nigerian economy. The environmental lobby could be a problem for Nigeria because if it caused, if it caused the countries to use less oil, it would mean a drop in revenue for Nigeria and ultimately economic calamity. Countries like Venezuela and other producers are obviously affected by environmental standards. But we must have realistic targets. And some of the targets, uh, if implemented, as some environmentalists believe, would cause major disruptions in economic life. 
a tropical rainforest in Mexico, hundreds of miles from the nearest village. This virgin corner of Central America could be almost anywhere in the third world, where vast new reserves of oil are being sought and found in the great global oil hunt. Here, where the local language is not Spanish, but Sonsil, Indian laborers working for the state oil company are cutting seismic lines in the forest, opening up paths for the oil geologists. You are damned if you don't have oil because you don't have cash and you cannot develop. And you're damned if you do have oil because you have cash, you develop, and in 25 years you have to pay the environmental price. Many developing countries today need ready cash. Oil to them is gold. And it is gold because it is immediately bankable, it produces cash on site, and this has meant that very many nations are now willing to explore and exploit oil in their territories. The coming of oil means jobs and money for these workers and their country. In the 1970s, third world countries still saw foreign oil companies as neo-colonialist exploiters. Today, that's changing. 20 years ago, the world oil industry was dominated really by oil nationalism as countries took control of the resources within their border. Today, that's really changed quite dramatically. And from Vietnam to Venezuela, you see uh, a new opening to international oil industries. Quite right. Uh, I took part in helping to expropriate these assets. I also uh, uh, took part last week in announcing operating contracts with a number of companies to develop uh, inactive fields in Venezuela. So the circle has come around completely. Certainly one of the great ironies is that Vietnam today is offering about the best terms and the most attractive terms to oil companies of any country in the entire world. And uh, throughout Latin America, you see uh, the reappearance of international companies invited in to bring their skills, their capital, and their technologies into what had been nationalized uh, domestic oil industries. Some of the biggest oil companies in the world are the state-owned companies of Venezuela, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. The bulk of the world's oil reserves belong to them, and they are beginning to compete with the major Western oil companies. In the meantime, the specter of oil shortage has, for the time being, been banished. The world has more than a trillion barrels of proven reserves, enough at current rates of consumption to last for 50 years. The major oil companies remain the epitome of the multinational, running global enterprises on a grand scale. The biggest of them all is Shell. We operate more than 100 countries. In any year, one or two of those countries, by definition, are almost certain to go sour. We're used to wars or civil wars or coups, whatever it is. We ride the rough and the smooth. And, uh, you know, if you have a wide enough spread of your chips, if you like, on the table, you can survive. Two thirds of the world's proven oil reserves are in the Middle East. In the first weeks of 1991, the world was reminded that power grows not only from the barrel of a gun, but from a barrel of oil. The Gulf War is already history, and three hours drive from Hollywood these U.S. Marines have been reenacting their war exploits for a TV miniseries. But before that, these men and these tanks were in the front line of Operation Desert Storm. Gunner! Eat, eat, eat. When the 
Iraqis invaded Kuwait. I was having dinner with my American colleague. And when we heard the news, we both went off to the Security Council. And we judged the vital importance of it being a breach of international law at a time when the community of the world was trying to establish international law. Now, the way in which that war developed, and in fact, ground forces were committed and force was used, was obviously connected with oil. Gunner, Kolak, two sets of troops. Left troops first. Come left, come left, come left. Get by, fire! On the way! Target right troops! At the outset, I thought the Gulf War would probably cause the American people to be more concerned about our declining production in this country. During the conflict, the world supply situation was very snug. So if you continue to, to reduce production here, over time, we have less capability in future years to try to protect uh, sources elsewhere. The Gulf War really emphasized once again just how dependent we are on oil. What would be the risk to our economies if Saudi Arabia had gone down too to an invasion? And the risk would have been horrific, because then you would have had Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, and Iraq in the hands of one man. Now, oil is certainly still a strategic commodity. I think the big thing that the Gulf War showed, which in a way is a little worrying, is that hitherto we had, OPEC had, had, has, had, had historically had four or five millions of barrels a day of spare capacity. Over the last period, 18 months or so, we've had no spare capacity in the system. In the first months of the Gulf crisis, the loss of oil from Kuwait and Iraq pushed prices up sharply. But prices fell as other oil producers cranked up production in order to get relief oil onto the market. Oil-producing countries saw that their interests lay with their customers, the West. There was little panic in the industrial countries, not even in Japan. Uh, oil is produced in so many countries in the world, and market forces work so well that no one, not Saddam Hussein or even OPEC, can effectively use oil as a political weapon. <laughs> My name is Atsushi Meguro. I live in Tokyo and I love driving. Japan has no real natural resources, especially oil, and it just feels very vulnerable in the sense that it can't control its own future. We lost World War II, so we changed our policy from military to economic growth. So at that point, we need the national resources, I mean, especially oil, to make the economic accomplishment. Oil is the blood of the 20th century. It's quite simple. Everybody cannot imagine his or her life without the oil. Now, Ohiro Amaya has written that the 20th century has been the age of oil. Oil power made this the American century. And it was oil that helped America defeat Japan in the Second World War. After the war, everybody wanted to emulate the Americans, the oil civilization. Other people were fascinated by this American way of life. Europeans and Japanese succeeded in doing so. Russians, Chinese, Indians, Africans, uh, those people so far are not successful. More than anyone else, Naohiro Amaya persuaded the Japanese to shift their industrial strategy away from oil. 
He convinced his government that the age of oil was coming to an end, that the next century will be the age of information. The Japanese are a good example of a country which has very little in the way of hydrocarbon resources, but has made admirable use of what it has and has used other sources of energy to, power its, to, to satisfy its power needs, in particular nuclear energy. But Japan is also the place which has perfected many of the forms of information technology. And where some of the electronic revolution has taken place, I think it's more than a coincidence it should take place in Japan, where in fact a low energy society has begun to grow, and maybe a low energy society will grow out of the end of the hydrocarbon age. We cannot give up the dependence on oil. It's impossible. Uh, even though in, uh, the information technology develops, still we have to use a certain amount of oil. However, the knowledge technology will make it possible for us to save the energy consumption to some extent. Japan is the second biggest importer of oil after the United States, and 57% of its energy is still oil-based. The Japanese know all too well that their hard-earned prosperity could fade into the night if other nations were to deny them oil. Any uh, consuming countries relying heavily on the imported crude oil would try to diversify sources of crude oil for the economic stability and also in order to avoid any uh, types of uh, oil crisis which we have experienced in, during the 70s and quite recently during the Gulf crisis. Today, many Japanese are taking a long, hard look at the vast territories of the former Soviet Union. Siberia is geographically close to Japan and could provide an alternative to the unstable Middle East. Some believe that Japanese money and American know-how will one day unlock East Siberia's wealth of oil and natural gas. If you went around the world today and talked uh, to people throughout the international oil industry, particularly geologists, and said, what part of the world are you most excited about? The answer from all of them would be almost uniform, the former Soviet Union. In the suburbs of Moscow, the commissars and the apparatchiks are moving out, and the Western oil men are moving in. The country dachas of the old party bosses are being taken over by their old enemy. Until pretty recently, the very amount of oil reserves in what was the Soviet Union was a state secret. But over the last three or four years, as the doors have opened there, the knowledge base has gone up. And there is a view today that the oil reserves of the former Soviet Union may be on the scale of a Saudi Arabia. Not as cheap and easy to produce by any means as a Saudi Arabia, but in other words, you're talking about one of the potentially great oil plays of the world. It's very nice to go back to countries you were kicked out of a long time ago. I mean, Russia was, in fact, you know, in fact, the cradle after the United States. It was the, the non-U.S. cradle of the non-U.S. industry. So we were kicked out in 1917, of course, and 75 years later, we're getting back. Great. It always happens in the end. It's 40 below zero in Western Siberia. The first foreign oil derricks were brought here from Texas. This Russian-American joint venture was financed with American capital. We're the only ones here because we were the first one to step to the plate to do it. And everyone else is cautiously watching to see if we succeed. Many other oil companies are gonna follow behind us. It's gonna be a massive investment in the oil industry in Russia and in Siberia. And what's really at stake here is the economy of the Soviet Union and the future well-being of the country. So to the extent that White Knights succeeds, 
additional capital investment will be brought into the Soviet Union to help develop their oil industry for much needed hard currency to build the economy here. The development of a nation that has been held back due to political circumstances. It's the unleashing of perhaps the next capitalistic frontier in the world. And certainly the unleashing of one of the great remaining oil provinces to be fully developed. The oil industry is used to going to parts of the world where things are uncertain, where there's a lot of political risk, but it's hard to find a situation that is more confused uh, than they face today in the former Soviet Union. And what's really holding back development is, is the uncertainty of lack of a political foundation, contractual foundation, financial foundation, and the basic question of who's in charge? Who do you make a deal with? And can the person that you make a deal with stick to it? White Knights the only foreign company drilling new wells here, was forced to put its Siberian operations on ice for a while when an arbitrary new tax law made the enterprise unprofitable. The great post-Soviet oil play is beset with political uncertainty. We don't yet know whether, in fact, the Soviet Union or the, its constituent parts can possibly survive the next 10 years without major disruption. Uh, is that huge quantity of the Earth's surface going to break up into other states? And what's going to happen before, in fact, this, this situation over the oil reserves can be turned around? It's really at a crossroads, and it could head uh, down a rather nasty road, or it could head towards quite a good political and economic road. I hope for their sake they take the latter. A marriage of Western capital and Russian resources could provide the answer. But what ordinary Muscovites want from this partnership is some evidence that the benefits will reach them. Not long ago, a newly married couple drove into a filling station to find, as usual, only two of the six pumps working. The bride and groom got stuck in a line and arrived two hours late for their own wedding reception. More than material prosperity is at stake. The peaceful transition to democracy requires an economic revival, which will depend heavily on oil and natural gas. Oil will be important as a sort of safety net or as a sort of floor. Uh, Russia, with its uh, natural resources, is a country that is in economic shambles today. But without oil, it would be an economic calamity. The former Soviet Union is still the largest oil producer in the world, but its antiquated industry is on the verge of collapse. The oil fields are symptomatic of Soviet mismanagement. In the last five years, production has dropped by 30%. Because of poor maintenance, 20,000 wells are not working. Wasteful and inefficient at the best of times, the industry is now counting on help from the West. It's going to be quite difficult because I believe the infrastructure has virtually collapsed so that uh, the pipelines are leaking, the machinery is out of date, production is falling, and all that. And so the first thing is to get the existing system back something like where it was. In Baku, the cradle of the old Russian oil industry, 19th century equipment is still at work. Nothing lives in these lakes. They are pure oil. This is just one of the many ecological catastrophes that with the collapse of communism have come to light throughout the former Soviet empire. Here, oil leaks from 37,000 miles of ill-repaired pipeline every year. Some estimate this ecological catastrophe to be the equivalent of 400 Exxon Valdez accidents. The native peoples have suffered most. The Soviet oil industry 
polluted great tracts of their hitherto unspoiled forest and tundra. White Nights is a sensitive to the environment here in Russia uh, and in Siberia as it would be anywhere in the United States. Uh, the tundra here is very sensitive. The lichen takes 30 years to grow, and we want to have a minimal effect with our presence here. We're very honored to be here with you today to represent White Nights. Нам доставляет большую честь быть здесь сегодня с вами. The Russian team that drilled for oil here in Radujny, Western Siberia, destroyed the hunting grounds of the Kanti people. Today, their new American partners are reaching out to the villagers. We would like to present you, the people of the village, in a forest with uh, ten snowmobiles. We wanted to present you, the people of the village, And so the Hydrocarbon Society comes to the Siberian village. Gasoline-driven snowmobiles replaced the reindeer herds decimated by the old Soviet oil industry. <laughs> Western oil companies must contend with this grim environmental legacy. They are applying new technology to the problem and bringing their higher Western environmental standards and awareness. There's a difference between the people who are making the decisions today in these companies and 20 years ago. 20 years ago, there was a, in a sense, just a, a rejection of the environmental consideration. Today, the decision makers recognize it's a, it's a reality and uh, they may even share the values. Certainly their children share the values and they realize it's something that they have to deal with and it's going to continue to be with us. The rapid growth of Mexico City has made it the largest city in the world. It is also one of the most polluted. Mariachi singers sing of oil. Their song calls petroleum the gift of the devil. The Mexican government is actively pursuing a $4 billion program to clean up a city. You look at Mexico City, congestion, pollution, and you, you wonder whether we are not all trapped. If every city is going to be like Los Angeles, God help us. If we think of of the South Asian market with uh, about one and a half billion people before very long, or the Chinese market. I mean, if you think of those people having, let us say, one car per two families even, you know, you really are talking about an amount of oil consumption and an amount of pollution, which would seriously affect the Earth's environment. The growth in petroleum is really in the third world. Uh, their consumption of oil, for example, has gone up by two and a half times over the last 20 years. It could easily double again over the next uh, 20. Uh, it's, it's, and, and even then, you wouldn't have scratched it. I mean, give every person in China a Vespa scooter, you'd have an energy crisis tomorrow. <laughs> a slum called Netza on the outskirts of Mexico City. People here live in poverty, but not without cars. The ideal world in Latin America is represented in a bad American movie full of cars uh, and lots of consumer goods, uh, cans of Coca-Cola and a TV set. This generates a wish or an aspiration in the masses for them, it is some kind of a cachet to own a television set or to own a car and have no roads. Oil is still seen as the shortcut to the consumer society. The possible ecological consequences would seem distant and unimportant to those who are denied Western prosperity.
it will not do to tell the third world, well, this is the cheap alternative, this is for your own good, although we don't have it, this is for your own good. The third world will not do that. They'll only do things which they consider to be part of a glamorous prosperity. We have such problems as malnutrition, poverty, a health crisis, political instability, and all of these impinge so much on people's daily lives that they need to sort out these problems first before they will come to the problems of the environment. I therefore don't see them addressing the problems of the environment for another 20 or 30 years. We're likely to see in the 1990s a, a new North-South confrontation the North will put increasing emphasis on environmental restrictions and regulations on the environmental agenda, while the South will be much more focused on economic growth, having the same opportunities to grow that the industrial countries of the North have had and the growth that the South needs because of its growing populations. The North wants to retain the status quo. The South wants to change it. So in a nutshell, the North is telling the South, you cannot develop in this same way, so tough luck. And the South is telling the North, we will develop, that we will go on polluting. In the sea of poverty, there is no democracy. So this poverty should be overcome, but at the same time, the environmental problem should be solved. This is a very hard question challenging the human wisdom. So far, no answer. The information technology, the information village that we live in today means that everyone around the world wants to adopt our lifestyle, wants to follow our mode of consuming oil. But if everyone does that, it's not sustainable. The political problems, the economic problems, the environmental, the pollution problems would mean that the world would explode. And it's that power that's going to lead to the development of new forms of energy, the high-tech energy of the future. It was California, the most populous state in America, that perfected the oil-burning lifestyle. Ultimately, technology will determine how long that lifestyle lasts. Doesn't seem to me hopeless at all. The uh, oil society has built up an awful lot of wealth which can be redeployed all the time if we have the political will to make a new kind of society with new kinds of energy and maybe a little more self-control in the next century. We've done this sort of thing before. We're not so dumb as all that. It takes an awful lot of brains to dig for oil and go after it. Those kinds of brains can dig for other kinds of energy too. Cars built before 1970 are the biggest polluters. One beloved old gas guzzler can cause as much pollution as 100 of the new cars. And the new cars are getting cleaner. America's cars are 50% more fuel efficient now than they were 20 years ago and alternatives to gasoline exist already. One day, electrically powered cars like this Japanese prototype could become a common sight. But before they do, considerable economic and technical problems will have to be overcome. Meanwhile, cleaner cars and cleaner gasolines have already reduced Los Angeles smog by 25% in the last 10 years. There's a growing view that the transitional fuel for the future is gonna be natural gas, uh, that the oil industry, oil companies, really over half their reserves in many cases are natural gas. The natural gas will be used more for electric generation, perhaps in vehicles, and maybe some say in the 21st century, instead of talking about an oil and gas industry, we'll talk about a gas and oil industry. Cars powered by natural gas reduce pollution. Major oil companies are big producers of natural gas. In Southern California, 
The U.S. mail and private courier services are experimenting with natural gas-fueled fleets. But many of the new technologies are expensive, whereas gasoline remains cheap, plentiful, and efficient. There really isn't an alternative, so far anyway, to the internal combustion engine. It's very difficult to see an alternative, especially for transport, because gasoline in particular and kerosene for airplanes, they're both extraordinarily efficient fuels. Oil and gas will be major industries 50 and probably even 100 years hence. So we'll be around. Oil has been a business of technological change ever since the first well was drilled. Today, the environmental conscience is galvanizing a vast range of new innovations. The future will be determined by a horse race among technologies, and billions of dollars of investment will be wagered on the outcome. People have been predicting the end of the oil age for many years. It's my prediction that the oil age will continue well into the next century with oil and gas and coal playing a major role in terms of supplying energy to the world. And of course, energy is what makes the quality of life good. People enjoy it. It uh, increases the, their ability to enjoy the finer things of life. In the end, what a British statesman said over 40 years ago still stands today. The kingdom of heaven runs on righteousness but the kingdom of Earth runs on oil. There's a lot of smog in Los Angeles, and like everybody else, I'm very concerned about that. But I must admit that when I get in my car and I step on the gas, I get over it. In the years since Errol Smith zoomed off in his red sports car, much has changed. Oil prices reached high levels that would have seemed inconceivable. They also crashed three times. Russia, in such disarray in the early 1990s, came back in a very big way to become the world's largest oil producer. Demand for oil flattened out in the industrial countries, but has taken off in the developing world, the emerging markets. China was a minor oil exporter at the beginning of the 1990s. Today, it is the world's largest oil importer, surpassing the United States. Climate change went from being an obscure, abstract issue to the subject of a global consensus on emissions by almost 200 countries, giving a new boost to an already growing renewable energy industry. Conventional energy continued to grow. Canadian oil sands became a major new supply and the number one source of U.S. petroleum imports. And while some were arguing that oil was running out, an unconventional revolution in North America brought shale gas and shale oil into the energy mix with far-reaching impact. But in other ways, the story told in the prize has remained on track. The oil industry continued to advance its technology at ever greater scale. The Middle East remains a region of turmoil and conflict and uncertainty, and oil continues to be deeply entwined with turbulent geopolitics. The spending to bring new oil and gas resources continues to grow, measured in many trillions of dollars. Since the early 1990s, the number of cars in the world has more than doubled to almost a billion. Some are hybrids, and the electric car has reappeared after a century-long absence. But most of them are fueled by gasoline and diesel, and overall, the global car fleet is expected to reach two billion within another quarter century. The world is using almost 40% more oil than it did in the early 1990s. Oil remains the fuel of economic growth, and even as new technologies come in, the resource that is fundamental to the very movement of modern civilization. So oil remains as it has been, a complex and dramatic story of technology, economics, politics, of ambition and dreams, and of what people want and how they want to live. It is an epic story that continues to unfold on a global scale. A century ago, Winston Churchill called oil the prize. And a century later, oil remains the prize. <laughs>